very well because you go to the pre-trib rapture study group and you've heard Tommy there. Some of you have heard Tommy at West Houston Bible Church and I've heard Tommy for the last 45 years. <laughs> so Tommy and I became friends. Randy Price, some of you may know him just as Randall Price, but Randy Price and I had known each other since about 1970, and he'd known Tommy since about then. And when Tom, I think it was the first day of Tommy's first year, my second year at Dallas Seminary, I saw them talking together and went over there, and that's how I met Tommy, was Randy. By the mailroom. By the mailroom, that's right. Street, yeah, yeah, out in the middle of the street, which somehow is appropriate. But uh, we were battle buddies all the way through. Uh, Dallas, our years at Dallas Seminary, and we have been close friends, co-authors, and everything else over the last 45 years or so, and thank God for that. So Tommy is arguably the, uh, the expert on dispensationalism, pre-trib rapture, and ha you can't believe the part of his library that just covers eschatology and dispensationalism and everything is is unbelievable, but he is going to come now and uh, talk, teach us about the history of dispensationalism. So, all right. Do not trip and hurt yourself in my church. Okay. <laughs> um, I didn't get my presentation in in time. So I'm going to get 30 years in purgatory for that. <laughs> and ho hopefully some of y'all will be with me uh, there. I will bail you out. Oh, okay. That's right. Somebody's got to get me out of there. <laughs> yeah. And stuff. But it, it's good to be here. And uh, as I sometimes say, it's good to be anywhere. Uh, and uh, uh, I didn't finish composing this because I thought I already had it done at one point. And uh, so I am a hypocrite because I'm so, such a meanie when it comes to having them for my, or my conference. <laughs> and here I am, the guy that doesn't have it for Robbie's conference, you know. So, not yet. what? It's already not yet. In what way? Okay, see, see, I'm slow uh, to do that. Yeah, it's already not yet in that way. Okay, so uh, people have been looking at this chart that we did. Uh, actually, I designed that uh, back in the year 2000. It's in our chart book called Charting the End Times. And um, we believe that history moves uh, from a garden to a city with a cross in between, basically, and there's progress. It's not this cyclical uh, stuff, which the, only the Bible basically has that view of history, and perhaps those that have been influenced by the Bible. And so the, uh, there are dispensations, and dispensations relate to ages or periods. Obviously, things were different before the fall even though that probably didn't last very long. And there were some changes in God's interaction with man after the fall, right? Got booted out of the garden, et cetera, and all of that. And so you often have a transitional event like the fall, the flood, et cetera, into the new dispensation or age. And uh, the church age is something that the New Testament says in four different places was not prophesied in the Old Testament. That's why it's called a mystery. And uh, so there are, you know, almost about 15 mysteries in that sense in the New Testament uh, about the church age. And, uh, and it's not a whodunit type mystery. It simply means a secret is the idea that it wasn't revealed. And so that's, it began suddenly and unexpectedly in God's plan, and that's why it's going to end suddenly and unexpectedly with the rapture in order to do what? Finish Israel, the 70th week of Daniel. 
And so uh, this stuff uh, has been revealed by God, and uh, this is why we, I charted in this way. So what is a dispensation? Well, it's a dis- dispensation is a distinguishable age or economy or period of time in which God tests man within the context of his master plan for history. And so there are, so that by the time you end history, uh, humanity, and I guess the angels to some extent, will have been fully tested in every possible theoretical way. And that uh, things will be demonstrated about that in history. And the result is, is that God will be glorified at a maximum level in history uh, because of this, as Romans teaches. So there are, I call this a list of dispensational concerns or things that uh, relate to that. Number one is the inspiration and authority of Scripture. All dispensationalists believe in inerrancy and, the, and those kinds of things. Uh, in fact, I like to point out, if you're a dispensationalist, it takes two steps to become a liberal. You, you first have to move away from dispensationalism because of, it, of what it involves. If you're like a Reformed theology guy, you can go directly into liberalism, which has historically happened. Uh, but because they allegorize scripture. You see what I'm saying? So you have to first quit allegorizing scripture or taking scripture literally, and then the next step is into liberalism. So it's kind of like the Texas two-step, you know, (laughs) on that. But consistent literal interpretation. Now, you know, Calvin and Luther have great definitions of literal interpretation as opposed to Rome. They just didn't practice it. (laughs) Or, Or it wasn't consistent. By consistent, we mean always using that hermeneutic and not lapsing into uh, some form of allegorization. And really, look up Calvin and Luther's uh, theoretical statement on hermeneutic, and they're great. Uh, Especially uh, Luther coming out of the Middle Ages, you know, where they had tremendous allegorization there. Premillennialism. And... Premillennialism was the dominant view in the early church. There's no doubt. Uh, everybody who talks about it for the first 300 or so years was a premillennialist. Well, except for those in Egypt, north, uh, north in Egypt. They're the only ones that weren't premillennial. Uh, they just didn't like it. And it wasn't until around 400 that Augustine invents amillennialism. So they were just anti millennial. And then amillennialism is, a, I guess you could say, a positive system that was developed at that point. But premillennialism or chiliasm is definitely what the early church clearly believed. And I think the fact that uh, the persecution ended around 313 uh, contributed to the decline of premillennialism as well, you see, because people say, you know, when, when you're being persecuted, uh, t- people tend to be more premillennial looking for a golden age, you know, rather than, and, and the persecution that they're experiencing and stuff. Futurism. See, there's four different ways of interpreting prophecy. And they relate to the f- four ways you can relate to time. Past, present, future, Timeless. And so the four ways of, and this has nothing to do with the millennium or anything like that, is uh, preterism, which thinks prophecy that we believe is future, is past. Uh, That's what the word preter, preterist, preterism means, gone by or past. Then there's historicism that believes the book of Revelation has been fulfilled during the 2,000 years of church history. And we're just waiting the second coming. We're waiting. They're waiting for Armageddon and the second coming, Seventh Day Adventists and people like that. Actually, much of the evangelical church from the early 1800s up until World War II were historicists. 
and that's why you read many of the commentaries that are older and you, you kind of wonder what's going on here, you see. And then you have futurists, which is us, that believes that these prophecies, probably the 60% of all Bible prophecy is still future to our own day. And then you have idealism. And that's among broader evangelicalism, that's probably the number one view of prophecy today, and that is uh, pox on all your houses. In other words, these are just ideas. They're not historically related. They're just ideas. Uh, and, of course, you have to look at all the different passages to see exactly what they mean by that. So uh, dispensationalism obviously is a futuristic. Now, you can be a futurist and not be dispensational, but most futurists are dispensational. Then there's a distinction between Israel and the church. And you know that's the big riry statement there that we'll look at in a moment, that God has a separate plan, even though there's overlappingness. Uh, is that a word? Uh, there, for Israel and then the church. And we've already talked about how the church is a temporary period. And the, the doctrine of the church is uniqueness in God's plan. Uh, that the church is a unique period where Jew and Gentile are co-equal in Christ. That's why you cannot have fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel until the church is taken out. That's the logic for the pre-trib rapture. Uh, because you have to have it returning to the time where Israel is the entity through which God is working. And you can't have that during the church age. Because Jew and Gentile are co-equal as Ephesians and Colossians talk about that. And so that began on the day of Pentecost, took a while for them to understand this, and it's going to end with the rapture, and there's probably going to be an interval of days, weeks, or years, most likely a few years, and then the tribulation will start the 70th week of Daniel, and so the church will not be the instrument through which God is working, because we'll be in heaven experiencing the, the, the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ in preparation for returning. And pre-tribulationalism, I think, I mean, it's, a, it's an issue in futurism I've already implied. You don't have to be that to be a futurist, but uh, pre-tribulational rapture is the dominant view. And then dispensations are periodization. And as, as we're going to see, the church has always believed in dispensations. It's one of the most widely held views, especially during the first 1,500 years of church history, uh, in periodization. In other words, periods of history that they like to divide up into segments, as I showed on my opening uh, thing. And that's not dispensationalism. Those are included in dispensationalism, but uh, virtually everyone up until the last hundred years when dispensationalism came along, they quit using that word to not be identified with us. Does that make sense? I mean, Charles Hodge believed in three dispensations, you see, and uh, those kinds of things. So progress of dogma, and what I mean by that is the uh, ch progress in the churches coming to understand theology and how they, we'll, we'll look at it more uh, and therefore, ecclesiology and eschatology are the last two things that have a mature development of it because you had to get the earlier doctrine straight and things are built logically on that. Uh, and so it makes sense that uh, a sophisticated view, you have most of these views articulated in the early church, but they're not really developed in a sophisticated way. So I would argue dispensationalism is a sophisticated development of ecclesiology and eschatology. So we'll talk about that more. So Ryrie's thing, or dispensationalism, is a consistent, literal, or plain interpretation of Scripture. And the emphasis is on consistent. 
And every, everybody, to some extent, just about, I'm talking about within, when I say everybody, I'm talking about evangelical, Bible-believing Christians, uh, can interpret the Bible literally to some degree, but consistent. And there, by the way, there are dispensations who are not consistent, but <laughs> theoretically we're supposed to be. And then you have the progress of revelation expressed through dispensations and covenants, yet one way of salvation. And uh, some of the early dispensationalists weren't clear on that. They made some statements here and there that opponents of us tried to use, which uh, they were misused. Uh, they didn't. That nobody, no dispensationalists I know really believe that, you see. Okay, and ecclesiology, the distinctiveness of God's plan for the church from Israel, which is why, why um, it was said to be a mystery in the Old Testament. And eschatology, the, which is futurist premillennialism. And pre-tribulational rapture, I would throw in there, even though, as I've already said, some don't hold that. And then the purpose of history is the glory of God. Believe it or not, Reformed theology doesn't put that as their main purpose of history. What's, what do they put? What? Kingdom. Salvation. Uh, yeah, they believe the, the, the goal and purpose of history is soteriological. And so that's why they tend to allegorize everything in the Old Testament, or future things in the Old Testament, you see, because you've, you've reached the culmination with the church age of salvation, you see. And um, so a, we're going to look at a definition of dispensations. I've already talked about scripture, uh, scriptural use of a dispensation, the features of dispensationalism, and the def definitions of dispensationalism. So Ryrie describes the essentials of dispensationalism as a distinction between Israel and the church. He means the plan for Israel and the church. So this grows out of the dispensationalist consistent employment of normal or plain or historical grammatical interpretation. And it reflects an understanding of the basic purpose of God in all his dealings with mankind as that of glorifying himself through salvation and other purposes as well. And of course, we believe God's main purpose is salvation, but it's not its only purpose. So the essentials, consistent literal interpretation, and there's a logic to this, that consistent literal interpretation leads to a distinction between God's plan for Israel and the church. So rather than saying that Israel is the church of the Old Testament, as covenant theologian people do, and not seeing a dispensational shift, therefore they merge these. So th this second one is really the key issue. Distinction between God's plan for Israel and the church. By, you know, the, the, you ready for this? This is amazing. Whenever the Bible talks about Israel, it's talking about Israel. I know that's hard to grasp intellectually, but <laughs> nevertheless, and when it talks about the church, it's talking about the church. Well, there are some uses in the Old Testament of the congregation in the wilderness, but it's pretty obvious. The church, the term church becomes a technical term in the New Testament. And I know only three or four passages talk about the universal church, but it does. Most are talking about a local church church. Why did they pick the word church? Assembly. You know, I don't know, but that's what happened. So that's the term. And then the glory of God is the purpose of history, as we've pointed out, which is the feature of dispensationalism. So the purpose of history is the glorification of God through Jesus Christ. We see in Romans eleven thirty six, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory of God forever. In other words, that covers it all. From him, past, through him, the present, 
and to him, future, are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. So Jesus Christ, as I like to say, is the hero of history uh, within the Trinity. And he's the hero of history because he became a man as well, right? And redeemed us, created the second Adam. He, he is the focus within the Godhead of uh, worship of God. Doesn't exclude the Trinity, but we're just saying he's, he's the agent in history. And so history is the glorification of God through Jesus Christ. And so every phase of history or dispensation is glorified, glorifying Jesus Christ through history. And that's why the eternal state, for example, is not a dispensation because it, it's the end of history and we go into, uh, and I believe it's not some timeless period, otherwise it'd be meaningless. It, it's sequences of time for eternity. As the song says, when we've been there 10,000 years, we've no less days of seeing God's praise than when we first began. Uh, some people want to call it timeless. No. If, if something's timeless, there's no sequence of history. You see, there's no sequence of events. It, you're in nirvana. <laughs> A pagan concept here of non-existence. So Jesus Christ, as we say, is the hero of history. And the focus and purpose of history is Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, who saves elect humanity by becoming the second Adam through a plan of his work, which is implemented by grace to those who believe the message of the gospel. So the progress of dogma, and this is the way I took John Hanna on uh, History of Doctrine, and he really emphasized this, that the development of the church's understanding uh, uh, in a sophisticated way of its theology started with you first got to figure out what the Bible is, what's inspired, and, and the, uh, who God is, the Trinity. And so you have that as the earliest sophisticated development of theology. And then... The, as I say, the Trinity, and then anthropology. You had the, all these discussions on the nature of man, and you have the different views that are worked out, and, you know, the heretics got banned, and, which is good. And uh, you have Christology then, the person of Christ. Why, why Christology? Because he's the God-man. So you have to have humanity understood, in order to understand what it means for him to be the God-man, you see. And so that Christology, for example, uh, when did the doctrine uh, of the atonement develop? The proper view for what until 1000 with, uh, what was his name? Anselm. Anselm. And the year 1000, before that, they believed in the ransom to Satan theory. It was the primary view That's, that Christ's death paid off Satan. Can you imagine that? That was the most widely held view. And it wasn't until Anselm around 1000. And justification by faith. Uh, some people think maybe a person here or there might have articulated something like it, but it wasn't known. Luther comes along, the first person to really teach the main purpose of the gospel. By the way, in the first 300 years, actually, to Augustine, you can't find the grace of God in the gospel in anybody that we know of. You know, it's all works, salvation. But were people saved? Obviously. They just didn't understand it. And, you know, we have the same kind of stuff today. That Some people get saved. Some of y'all probably gotten saved under the craziest <laughs> things. And then you find out later what it's all about. But you got saved in that crazy, not very correct in, uh, situation, you know. So uh, salvation's not by knowledge. It's by faith in Christ and what he says. You know, a lot of people just say, I, I just know that what Christ did for me 
is the basis of salvation. They don't understand all of that other stuff. And I'm not advocating that you have some minimalist approach or anything. I'm just saying that's the way it's been for many people. Uh, and then you have the development of ecclesiology. That's not till really the 1700s or so when it's being developed. And that's why you have all these bishops and all this stuff early in the church and things. They simply uh, you know, did that. And then eschatology, the doctrine of the last things. Once again, they had views of this, but it wasn't sophisticatedly developed. And that's why I think um, really in the 1800s, uh, you begin to have the development of dispensationalism, which is a uh, sophisticated thing. So the word literal, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, which uh, that's the 30 plus volume version, <coughs> uh, says literal means of or pertaining to letters of the alphabet. Wow. Also, representing the very words of the original. Then, this dictionary says in relation to the Bible, quote, the distinctive epithet of that sense or interpretation of a text which is obtained by taking its words in their natural or customary meaning and applying the ordinary rules of grammar, and they say opposed to mystical or allegorical. So an illustration of that would be uh, you take uh, Israel to refer to the church. The, the, the letters say what? Israel. And they think church. And that's why it's called replacement theology, because whether it's that issue or a lot of other issues, the letters say something, but they think something else because of their teaching or something. You see what I'm saying? And so we learn from what is said and at these points where we disagree, uh, they bring in ideas from outside the text and impose them on the text, the meaning of the text. That's allegorical or mystical interpretation. Now, there's two senses of literal. We use it in two different ways. We use it in a broad sense for literal interpretation that I've been talking about. Literal, as we said, uh, interpretation understands the text according to what is written. For example, Israel means Israel, church means a church. Okay, that's the broad sense. And we switch back and forth automatically. <clears throat> and then in a, small, in a microcosm sense, every word or phrase in any language can be used either denotatively or connotatively. It can be used to refer to plain literal, uh, in other words, he died, that's a plain literal statement, or figuratively, connotatively, he kicked the bucket. That is a metaphorical use for he died. And so when you, every word or phrase can be classified in one or two, one of these areas or not. Uh, the word run run. There's a run of salmon. He hit a, he scored a run. Those of you in the military, he has the runs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and, and so there's all kinds of uh, connotations to particular words, but every word can be classified as plain or figurative, you see. So we don't the te and the context determines that. And I remember when I first was studying the Bible, <clears throat> uh, I would go to something like, uh, what's that, Strong's Dictionary or something, you know, and they'd list all the possible renderings of a word, and I would pick the one I liked best. Anybody ever done that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I like that word in this context. <laughs> Here. And I could not have verbally explained why that particular nuance was the one to go with that, but that's how I did it uh, way back in the day. But then I met Robbie. No, I was just kidding. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and so the golden rule of interpretation is when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Now, our critics say that we've developed a common sense method of interpretation, and that philosophy of common sense rationalism is the basis for our hermeneutic. Well, if you just took that first part of that definition, you might could argue that when the plain sense makes sense, makes common sense, seek no other sense. But it has a further qualifying statement. Therefore, take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning unless the facts of the immediate context studied in the light of related passages and axiomatic and fundamental truths indicate clearly otherwise. So it's got clarification. And so when they try to apply the, the common oh, you're just a product of rationalism, common sense, because in the 1800s that was the dominant philosophy in the culture and society, and therefore uh, you're simply a product of your age or time or whatever. No, this definition, I think, you know, does away with that. So the dispensations deal with God's plan for history, as we've shown the sequences. The covenants deal with how God relates to people in history. I remember in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, most Bible churches, pastors would have a uh, series on the dispensations, and they would also have a series on the covenants. I, I don't see any, hardly any of those going on today. For some reason, all that evaporated, generally. Uh, and dispensations have always believed in the eight covenants and taught it just as much as they've taught dispensational dispensations or dispensationalism. And, uh, but covenant theology is not based on the biblical covenants. So dispensations equal God's historical plan and the covenants his relational interaction. With people, So the covenants relate to how God relates to people. And dispensations talk about his plan. Those are two different areas. You see what I'm saying? And so we, we teach on both areas. So the theological covenants, covenant theology, taught the covenant of redemption, the covenant of works. And some taught the covenant of grace. But none of these are grounded in... Uh, exegesis. They're theoretical covenants that God decreed to save people uh, and the covenant of works relates to man's works in some way and the covenant of grace. I, I forget all the nuances there. Some of y'all probably, I'm sure, know it better than me, but these, when you read about them, they're not based on exegesis. It's philosophical, abstract stuff. And, but they're called covenant theology. Now, I, here's a diagram. And uh, as I sh show on the right, you have a historical prophetical text. And they're run through this covenant of grace lens. And therefore, it spiritualizes or soteriologizes everything, the text. Does that make sense? So that it, it destroys, especially uh, in the Old Testament or future things like the book of Revelation or a future revelation about the future into a non-historical thing. So covenant theology believes the fu that future historical passages will not take place in history, but are only illustrative of the doctrine of salvation. Now, there's a spectrum. Some take some things future, but generally speaking, this is their big idea that impacts them. So the implications of covenant theology is that they believe the entirety of Scripture revolves around the first coming of Christ and his soteriological redemption of humanity. Therefore, God's unfinished plan for Israel, which has been postponed during the current church age, has no purpose in history. 
Thus, Israel is replaced by the church, and her future history is spiritualized and abstractly applied to the church. And as some of you all know, I've dealt a lot with what's called preterism. And they believe that there is absolutely no future uh, passages that talk about the future. It's all been fulfilled in the past. There's a spectrum of preterists. Some are mild preterists, some are partial preterists, some are full preterists, you know. <clears throat> I have some comments I better not make. But <clears throat> sa salvation in dispensationalism, the basis of salvation is always Christ's death, right? There's no other basis. The requirement of salvation is always faith or trust in Christ's death, you know, as a payment for our sin. And the object of faith is always God, in this case, second person of the Trinity. And the content of faith changes in each dispensation, but always focuses on Christ. In other words, he's told to get out of the land, Abraham, and go to this particular land. And and it says in that same context, and Abraham believed God, and it was credited unto him as righteousness, imputed is, is the word there. Uh, he, he obeyed what God, you know, and clear it's the gospel today. So the idea and use of the term dispensation has been used throughout the church history in the writings of fathers up until the last hundred years by theologians of all stripes. It appears that the modern development of the system of theology known as dispensationalism has led to the disuse of that term. The Westminster Confession even uses it. Chapter 7, section 6. There are not, therefore, two covenants of grace differing in substance, but one and the same under various dispensations. Boy, I can buy that. That's really good. By the way, the chairman of the Westminster Confession was a premillennialist. <laughs> Something like 25% of the people at the Westminster Confession were premillennialists. They weren't dispensational, but they were premillennial. And um, but even strict followers of the Westminster Confession today don't always follow every little nuance because it reflects historicism and some other things that you know they don't agree with uh, and Lewis Perry Chafer was put on trial by the Southern Presbyterian Church and Oswald Alice and they said that he did not comport and Dallas Seminary did not comport with the Westminster Confession and they had a five-year study committee in the late 30s early 40s and the committee uh, concluded they didn't say he did and they didn't say he didn't <laughs> A real decisive decision there. <clears throat> but it had the effect of prohibiting uh, Dallas grads from going into the Presbyterian Church. Up until World War II, 80% of Dallas grads went into the Presbyterian Church. According to uh, Rudolf Renfrew's PhD dissertation, University of Texas in the, the 1950s. And um, then they started going into Bible churches, and uh, like Pantego Bible Church is 110 years old. It used to be Pantego Presbyterian Church. There's three or four. In a, what's that big Bible church uh, in the middle of Dallas somewhere? It used to be, you know, it's, it's 100 years old as a Presbyterian. Uh, John Walford pastored a Presbyterian church in Fort Worth, Northwest, Northwest Bible. It's now okay. And then when he became president, he had to move to Dallas, and they became a Bible church with the, with the whole thing, you know. And almost virtually all of the early Dallas guys were Princeton grads. And in fact, um, you ever heard of E.F. Harrison? Okay, back in the day, um, J. Grisham, May, you know, Princeton had about 100 students, which was pretty normal for back then. It was the top conservative Presbyterian seminary. And Machen was the Greek professor, and guess who was his, the second Greek professor? E.F. Harrison. When Princeton went, went under in 29, 
E.F. Harrison taught for 17 years at Dallas Seminary. And uh, Lewis Berry Chafer did not pay him salaries. They had to, well, you know, speak and all of that. And he had like six or seven kids, and so he went to Fuller, where they would pay him a decent salary, you know. And uh, I happened to have him in a Campus Crusade class back in 1975 for New Testament introduction. And he was very old back then. But nevertheless, also, I forget the Hebrew professor. They had a Hebrew, uh, one of the Hebrew professors who... Robert Dick Wilson was the main one, and this other guy was the other one, and he taught at Dallas for a year after it was uh, done away with. And then he founded Faith Theological Seminary. Does anybody know who that would be, what his name is? Well, then he went, uh, and no, no. Uh, Francis Schaeffer was a dispensational pre-mill, pre-trib, and he co-founded the Bible Presbyterian denomination with Carl McIntyre. Francis Schaeffer did. A lot of people don't realize Francis Schaeffer was pre-trib and all of that. But nevertheless, uh, so people, everybody used the term dispensation until dispensationalism became what it is today. Arnold Ellert, in his uh, history of dispensation, bibliography of dispensationalism that I came out in the 1930s, I think, at, in Bibsack, says, it seems likely that the roots of the whole doctrine of ages and dispensations will have to be traced back to the six creative days and the seventh day of rest of Genesis, which has been considered prophetically symbolic of a number of periods of development to be followed by a period of utopia as the Sabbath follows the six days of work. So what he's saying is... Uh, not just in Christianity, but in pre-Christian Judaism, many thought that the earth would last 6,000 years. A day is with the Lord is as 1,000 years, you know, Psalm 90, I think. And uh, therefore, uh, the six days reflect, when connected with 1,000 years each, uh, the purpose and length of history. I used to really like that view. <laughs> Problem is, <clears throat> we're 22 years past <laughs> the 6,000th <thousandth> year. <laughs> so I'm not, uh, well, maybe about 6,000 years. How's that? No. Oh, well. But uh, this was so, this was extremely widely held. Uh, David Gregory, a learned mathematician and astronomer of Oxford, England, who died in 1710, says, in the first verse of the first chapter of Genesis, the Hebrew letter Aleph, uh, which in the Jewish uh, arithmetic stands for a thousand, is six times found. Wow, did y'all know that? <laughs> how, many, how many have included this in your sermon lately? You know, okay. <laughs> from, from hence, the ancient Kabbalist, and uh, Kabbalists or mystics, is that right, Arnold? Yeah. Concluded that the world would last 6,000 years. So this is pre-Christian Ju Judaism that he's referring to. And he goes on and says, Because also God was six days about the creation, and a thousand years with him are but as one day. Therefore, after six days, that is 6,000 years duration of the world, there shall be a seventh day or millenary, millenary uh, Sabbath of rest. That's another statement from that. Rabbi Baal Katarum, 1734, said, There are six millenniums in the first verse of the first of Genesis, answering to the 6,000 years which the world is to continue. You see, so here, this is the logic. And Rabbi uh, Gadala about 1610, says, At the end of 6,000 years, the world shall return to its old state without form and void, and after that it shall wholly become a Sabbath. In other words, yeah. Theopompus, who flourished in 340 B.C., relates that the Persian Magi taught the present state of things would continue for 6,000 years. Who do you think influenced the Persian Magi? Daniel, yes. Uh, 
after which Hades or death would be destroyed and men would live happy. Sounds like Buddhism, right? Happy. Is that one of the fruit of the Spirit? Oh, that's not, that's joy. Not happy. Okay. Bishop Russell, from whom we extract, adds that the opinion of the ancient Jews on this point may be gathered from the statement of a rabbi who said the world endures 6,000 years and in the 1,000 or millennium that follows the enemies of God will be destroyed. Yay! See, that was 300 years before Christ. So the Jewish tradition of 6,000 years followed by the Sabbath millennium dates at least from the 2nd century B.C., uh, the approximate date of Rabbi Ellis, Elisus, according to Bishop Russell of Scotland. Well, who can debate Bishop Russell of Scotland? So the Christian sex and septimillennial view uh, tradition dates back to at least the epistle of Barnabas, the earliest of the apostolic <laughs> fathers, usually dated or between 70 to 70 AD before the canon was actually closed. The epistle contains the following lines, quote, and even in the beginning of the creation, he makes mention of the Sabbath and God made in six days the works of his hands and he finished them on the seventh day and he rested the seventh day and sanctified it. Uh, Irenaeus, about A.D. 130, said, who was the bishop of Lyon, France, or France, excuse me, writes, For in as many days as this world was made, so in so many thousand years shall it be concluded. For the day of the Lord is as a thousand years, and in six days created things were completed. It is evident, therefore, that they will come to an end at the 6,000th year. That makes sense. Well, I'm just saying, that I'm just showing you this is a widely held view that they believed in that is a precursor to the rise of dispensationalism. You see what I'm saying? Isaac Watts, a great hymn writer, who was a premillennialist, by the way, he wrote an essay of some 40 pages entitled the harmony of all the religions which God has prescribed to men and all his dispensations toward them. So Watts said the dispensations of God may be described more briefly as the appointed moral rules of God's dealing with mankind considered as reasonable creatures and as accountable to him for their behavior both in this world and in that to come. Each of these dispensations of God may be represented as different religions, or at least as different forms of religion appointed for God in the uh, several successive ages of the world. Now, I think he's getting pretty close to a modern view of dispensationalism there. So, usually, today we generally believe, and, and this is uh, Darby's view of the dispensation, the dispensation of innocence. Uh, are the religion of Adam at first, <laughs> the Adamic dispensation, uh, Adamic uh, dispensation of the covenant of grace, or the religion of Adam after the fall. So he's saying after the fall, Adam was dealt with in grace. The Noahic dispensation, or the religion of Noah. Fourthly, the Abrahamic dispensation, or the religion of Abraham. Uh, the Mosaic dispensation or the Jewish religion, the Christian dispensation, and uh, that person does not have the full thing. So as dates come and go, the millennium fails to materialize. Revisions are necessary. It would appear, however, uh, that if the year 2000 AD should come and go without the great events taking place, the whole septimillennial tradition and theory would be proved erroneous. He's writing this in the 1930s. <clears throat> For hardly anybody would want to place the commencements of the first millennium any later than 4004. I, th I think it's probably 4000, but you know we won't get in a fist fight over that. <laughs> this brings to a close the history of the septa and sect 
millennial uh, tradition, according to Ellert, perhaps it is not our place to caution again here that this is not dispensationalism, but in order to study dispensationalism intelligently, which of course we want to do, right? Uh, especially in its time period aspect, it is necessary to know the background of this tradition, and certainly that was is part of the background. So, the year 1825 seems to be the logical dividing line between the old and new dispensationalism. This is not to forget that many of the roots of later systems are to be found in works before that date, nor that much of the older philosophy is carried over in later periods. So, He's saying that was a big shift in 1825. And so here's Darby's dispensations, yeah. The paradoxical state to the flood, number one, Noah. Number two, number three is Abraham. Number four is Israel, and he divides that into three sections. Under the law, under the priesthood, and under the kings. And then fifthly, the Gentiles. Sixthly, the spirit. And seventh, the millennium. That's pretty close to what most of us hold today. It's not exact, but it's pretty close. That's Darby's view. And Darby was born in 1800. Easy to remember his dates to 1882. And he's considered the primary father of dispensationalism. And he is, uh, through a movement known as the Plymouth Brethren, made up primarily of former Anglicans in the late 1800s. Uh, for the first 50 years, the brethren were made up of a large number of the highly educated and scholarly class. In fact, it's amazing. There's probably a lot of intellectuals from that period that you didn't realize were brethren from England. Uh, it, it started out, and uh, it says, however, today it's just the opposite, see? Because they, they didn't believe in going to seminaries and things. Back then... A university, uh, for example, Darby goes to Trinity University there in Ireland, which was considered more intellectual than Oxford and Cambridge at that time because it had produced many more scholars than Oxford and Cambridge within the Christian faith because Trinity College was in Ireland and only 11% roughly of Ireland was Protestant. The rest were Catholics. And therefore, they were more rigorous. This is at least the explanation people give. They were more rigorous in the Christian faith than Oxford and Cambridge at this time. And uh, so, um, by the way, he was born and raised in London and went to Oxford, I think, when he was 14, you know. And he won the, the Gold Classic Award for uh, the best student, and they didn't give those every year. It's not like we have, uh, he, you know, like Andy has won the, what awards twice at Dallas? Bible Exposition, Bible Exposition Award twice, only got to win it twice. At Dallas, they didn't give it every year. They only gave it when uh, they thought something was really good, you see? So they might go five years or 10 years without giving that, and he won the gold medal award for being the top student there. And they didn't, they had no courses in Bible or theology. And everybody learned Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. Everybody. No matter, you didn't have majors. You had this uh, same curriculum that everybody had. And then there were three professions that people that had this would go into. And it was either clergy, a lawyer, or a doctor. And this is why you see a lot of these guys switching back and forth, you know, back in those days. And then if you were going to go and be a clergyman, you would go and read theology under a pastor for a few years, and then you would be examined to do that. But also, on Saturday mornings for four hours, uh, they lectured in Bible and theology, but you didn't get any credit for it, and you had to go. So, as I say, Darby only had that kind of upbringing and training, and then he goes and goes to law school for three years. He graduates and realizes that he didn't, God was calling him into the ministry, 
and his father disinherited him. <clears throat> but uh, nevertheless, so an evangelical and what what you had at that time. So I, did I finish that? Every even though they were very strong Calvinists, as was the Anglican Church at that time, there is no is no longer the case today. Uh, so an evangelical. You had, uh, by the early 1840s, uh, people who wanted to have in every parish an evangelical pastor. And so if that church did not have a guy from the Anglican church that was an evangelical, they started something called chapels in that parish. And that's the idea of a chapel. And so they would start a chapel or a church to make sure that every parish in all of England had an evangelical witness for people to go to church in. And uh, often the clergyman that went there was an Anglican, sometimes not, uh, so that they would uh, be able to have that kind of uh, uh, stuff. So by 1850, it is estimated that over 50% of the Anglican clergy were premillennial Calvinist. Not, and why were they not dispensational? Like J.C. Ryle is a tremendous illustration of, of this. Because if they couldn't have the state church and be a dispensationalist, that makes sense. And in the 1830s, there was a big blow up of whether or not to disestablish the state church in England. And they didn't, and the logic that they used was uh, uh, related to the local church. So you couldn't really theoretically be a dispensationalist, but people like J.C. Ryle are as close to being that as you could as a futurist. Does that make sense? And stuff. And so uh, the Brethren and all these other stuff uh, started taking over that area. So Darby's rapture view development First, Darby says that he realized the absolute divine authority and certainty of the Word of God as a divine link between us and God, which caused the Scriptures to gain complete uh, ascendancy over me. In other words, and he says all of this is what happened when he had a writing accident and he was uh, put up in bed um, at his sister's house. And her husband uh, later became the head Supreme Court guy in all of Ireland. You know, they they were were aristocrats, you see. And so for like three or four months, he he was uh, being taken care of there at at Pennyfeather or Pennyworth, what was their names? I forget, something like that. And second, he states, I came to understand that I was united to Christ in heaven. And by the way, Darby's only reading uh, you know, from his Greek New Testament and Hebrew Bible. During it. It's all he read. Uh, and that consequently, my place before God was represented by his own. Again, he wrote, personal assurance of salvation and a new condition by being in Christ, the church is his body. Third, Darby understood more fully his present standing with Christ in heaven. Such a heavenly standing becomes the basis for much of Darby's theology that sees the believer already positioned with Christ in heaven. I was in Christ, accepted in the beloved, and sitting in heavenly places in him. This led me to directly to uh, the apprehension of what the true church of God was, those who were united to Christ in heaven. And then fourth, he says, that he realized that he should daily expect the Lord's return which if, if you were any other view other than pre-trib, you couldn't daily expect the large return because of the things that had to happen. Being a pre- Darby was probably a post-millennialist before he, this conversion here. At the same time, I saw that the Christian having his place in Christ in heaven has nothing to do, nothing to wait for save the coming of the Savior, see, in order that uh, to be set in fact, in the glory which is already his position in Christ. Further, he says, I saw in that the word, the coming of Christ to take the church to himself in glory. Darby speaks of being in Christ, the church as his body, Christ coming to receive us to himself. 
All this was when laid aside, and that's the person whose house he's at, at EP's in 1827. So this is before Margaret McDonald or any of these people ever even came on the scene. So he couldn't have gotten it from them, but that's a whole other thing. Again, Darby says of his convalescence discovery, the coming of the Lord was the uh, other truth which was brought to my mind from the word as that which, if sitting in heavenly places in Christ, was alone to be waited for, that I might sit in heavenly places with him. Fifth, Darby saw a change in dispensation. This could mean that it was at that time that shifted in his eschatology from post-millennialism and pre-millennialism. Uh, Christ coming to receive us to himself and uh, collaterally with that, the setting up of a new earthly dispensation from Isaiah uh, 32, more uh, particularly the end. I, I've read Isaiah 32 twice. I can't figure out what he's saying. But nevertheless, all this was when laid up at penny, penny something in 1827. So that's what he says. He writes in his studies in Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 32 brought me to the early consequence of the same truth, uh, though other passages might seem more striking. <laughs> to me now, but I saw an evident change of dispensation in that chapter when the spirit would be poured out on the Jewish nation and a king reign in righteousness. So Isaiah 32 was taught me that the new, about a new dispensation, and I saw there would be a David reign, millennial reign, and did not know whether the church might not be removed uh, before 40 years' time. At that time, I was ill with my knee, and it gave me peace to see uh, what the church was. And I saw that I, poor, wretched, and sinful J. and Darby, knowing too much, yet not enough about myself, was left behind. Hey, good title for a book. <clears throat> and let go. But I was united to Christ in heaven. Then that, uh, what was I waiting for? Uh, he, he's talking about a person that visited him. You have three different witnesses that visited him during this time, which I can't get into, that confirm that this is when he came up with this, you see. Uh, came up and said that uh, they were teaching some new thing in England. I have it, I said. So uh, he, he comes up with that view, as I say, during that time. But it took about 15 years before he really got into it. And... Uh, Quickly, since I'm out of time, James Hall Brooks in St. Louis was a Princeton-trained pastor. He died in 1897, Presbyterian, of course. And uh, he is considered the father of American dispensationalism and the father of pre-tribulationalism, American pre-tribulationalism. And he had the largest church in St. Louis, and he was president for three years of the Presbyterian denomination and all this. and uh, Well, he's considered the father. There's his gravestone there in St. Louis. And uh, in the same graveyard is another guy there that we found. Rush Hudson Limbaugh III. And uh, so, I, don't, I can't get into this, but he discipled Schofield. Brooks did. And Schofield, of course, had a tremendous influence. And Schofield discipled Lewis Berry Chafer, the founder of Dallas Seminary. And uh, so dispensationalism grew out of Schofield Bible and later Dallas Seminary and all of, the, all of those influences. Actually, yeah, a lot more than that, but my time's up. Questions, comments, testimonies, prayer requests. Uh, Tommy, thank you. Uh, can you explain um, what you understand the dispensation in Darby's list? It said after the Israel, it said 
Gentiles and then spirit. What's the Gentiles after Israel before spirit? Let me go back and look at that. Is that it? Yeah, five Gentiles. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> takes gen it takes genuine humility to say, I don't know. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I want you to do a research paper and get back with us. On that. It, uh oh. It, isn't that what they told you in, in school, you know, when you ask a question like that? <laughs> in light of that, I don't know whether I want to ask my question or not. Okay. Okay. Uh, where did hyper-dispensationalism come from? Uh, it came from, uh, who's that guy in England who's a descendant of one of the reformers? Bollinger, Bollinger yes. Oh, that, okay. E.W. Bollinger developed. About, about, what, about what time period? What year? Uh, he developed that in the, either the late 1800s or early 1900s. Okay. And that guy is amazing. Bullinger, yeah. Have you ever looked at his body? I mean, at Dallas, we had to use Bullinger's uh, yeah. figures of speech. I did that back in the early 70s. Right. Yeah. Everybody, everybody right. still uses that. Nobody's exceeded uh, that. And yet, uh, the common belief among many other people is that we don't understand figures of speech. <laughs> and yet, the, book, the best book ever done still being used was by Bullinger there. And you, have you ever got his companion Bible? That is amazing, the information he has in there. That guy, like I say, he was, he was a descendant of one of the reformers, Heinrich Bullinger. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm tagging right. on that question, we would say that that which is the mark of the church is the baptism by the Holy Spirit. And that's what comes on the day of Pentecost. So in hyper-dispensationalism, what do they see as the distinctive of the church, especially since, like, in Ephesians 3, or 1 through 8, Paul says it's, it's this uh, mystery of this dispensation of grace that was given to me for you, and then it goes on to explain that it's, you know, Gentile and Jew together as one in the body of Christ. That's the result of the baptism by the Spirit. How do they get around that? They as say that the early part was the Jewish church and later the Gentile church. And so baptism, and some would even say the Lord's Supper, is only for the Jewish church. And when the Gentile church came in later... So they don't really believe in a unity of Jew and Gentile in one body in Christ. They do. They do, but they still have this, right. okay. this view. It's I mean, called a lack of logic. Well, that, that's how wrong views often develop. Uh, it, it, it's not just logic it's have, back there in the back. It's just it's having the right presupposition. Okay, who's got a question in the back? Right there. Just keep walk back there, Robbie, and you'll see them. How, how come this microphone isn't working? That's, it's not my fault. No. <laughs> great, great presentation. Um, I'm actually taking a dispensations class from a great uh, seminary, uh, Schaefer Theological Seminary, right now. So, is that a good school? Take it. Yeah, it's good school. <laughs> um, did the did traditional dispensationalism increase when the state of Israel uh, came yes. about? Yes. And what did the covenant theologian folks say about that at that time? In fact, I talked to R.C. Sproul one time for about four hours, and. Uh, he said that he actually, in 1967, became a premillennialist for a couple of years. He was <laughs> and, uh, was that partial premillennialism? Well, he was. He didn't continue. But I guess he got over it. <laughs> but, One uh, more. Uh, okay, I'll tell you. Gary North and the Reconstruction Society had oh. nothing to do with anything. You know, uh, yeah, Israel's a, a nation, and uh, some of them even argue for the Khazar theory view, which is why I have a chapter in my book on Israel dealing with that, because I've never seen anybody have a chapter rebuting, refuting the Khazar theory, and that is that Jew, modern Jews like Arnold are not real Jews. 
They don't have the blood of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in their veins because uh, in the uh, 800s, uh, Khazaria was part of, which is kind of the Ukraine now, uh, had converted to Judaism for a year and a half because the, uh, the king didn't want to be, go with Christianity because he would be absorbed into Christendom. And he didn't want to go with Islam. He'd be absorbed into the Islamic thing. And so he decided to convert to Judaism. <laughs> and so uh, some of the Jews, for about 150, 200 years, went there. And they were eventually uh, wiped out, you know, in some war and everything. And so they say, well, these are just a bunch of Gentiles uh, who claim to be Jews back in, in that day. And they're not, they don't really have the DNA of a, of a Jewish person in them. And uh, some Reconstructionists are big on that view, for example. And, uh, in fact, Remember, John Hanna. Four years ago, we had Bennett Greenspan here, who, who at that time yes. owned one of the top three uh, DNA genetics dis, you know, investigation thing. And he presented a, a very solid case that, that this is an impossible theory. Uh, genetically, that the that the Jewish people are descendants of the Khazars. Right, they have and, they have the marks uh, in their DNA in the yes. in their DNA of a Middle Eastern origin, not of a um, you know Slavic Eastern European or, origin. Okay, so that was pretty good. So you can go back and listen to that. That was an excellent presentation uh, by Bennett. Yeah. So, all right, we got one question down here. First of all, thank you. Uh, one of the marks that I, you know, observe with as you go through the history is the development of doctrine within dispensationalist or dispensationalism. What areas would you suggest for the next generation of areas that maybe could use further developing and hashing out? Well, I didn't even talk about progressive dispensationalism, and that's said to be a, a development. And it's not. It's a move away from it because. Uh, Bach and Blazing and others believe that the church is a uh, form of the millennium. Or no, no. What, what's their? Yeah, already not yet. Which which doesn't have make it a distinct entity. You see, and so they've compromised. Uh, I, I have a chapter in a book edited by Ryrie called Dispensationalism Today, is that where I talk about that and uh, refute that, I believe, you know, and, you know, I used to spend hours talking to Blazing and Bach about all this stuff, yeah. and it is, but, what was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> what, what should we be studying, thinking, what okay. topic should we be addressing that in the future? I, 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 I was saying what I just said because... I don't think there needs to be more development of dispensationalism, but that's not that wasn't your question, but that was in my mind, uh, so I, th I had to get rid of it there. <clears throat> but I think just uh, defending traditional dispensationalism, because I think it, you know, the Ryrie, the Ryrie version of dispensationalism is what I think is 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 the mature development of it. And uh, interacting with things like the history. That's the number one issue brought up against dispensationalism is like. How about, how about Babylon needing more development? Well, yeah, exactly. You know, Charlie Dyer right. the work there, and all of that. Yeah, there's some places in, within. Babylon Eschatology. means Babylon. Yeah. And yeah. Andy, of course, has done a lot of, he did two dissertations or a dissertation and a thesis on that. Go ahead. Thank you. Is it on? Hello? Oh. Thank you. Thank you. It was great teaching. Mine is uh, dispensation versus dates. The question is that how important is the date, like so many theologians have certain dates, uh, like the hyperstatic union or the flood, 1401. Uh, uh, did I get that right? No. No, I didn't. I'm sitting up here going, 1401. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, 
Exodus generation. Yeah, ex that, and that's when they, th that was when the conquest generation went in, was about right. 1406. I got that wrong. Yeah, 1446 to 1406 was the Exodus generation. The question I have that so many people come to me, well, mostly the kids, is if they can't get the dates right, how do we know it's true? Well, you can get the dates right because there are 39 genealogies in the Bible and only two have numbers attached. Genesis 5 and Genesis 11. So guess what? They're intended to tell you the length of time from creation. So it gets you, what does it get you to? The call of Abraham or something. Yeah, the call of Abraham around 2166 right. BC. If you go with the Masoretic text, but if you go with well, these... I don't with go with anything other than the Masoretic LX, text. LX, LX. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we'll fix that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Um, but, so, but So that gets you to the call of Abraham. And there's some other biblical factors uh, that you can use to uh, do that. Now, the date of the Exodus is a whole other thing. And I don't know how important it is. Uh, so. Okay, um, I want to bring this to a close because we have somebody special that is watching from Zhitomer, Ukraine right now. And that's Igor Smolyar. And so we want to say hi to him, so clap and let's give him a good... Because, Eager, we've got all these pastors here, and we're all praying for you and Daniel in Jatomer and for Ukraine, and as well for uh, your wife, Julia, and uh, for Sophie and Matthew, who have gone to Poland and eventually to eastern Germany. So we've got a lot of prayer support here that's going up for you, and it's great that you were able to uh, focus in on the and listen to the conference today. So uh, we'll be back tonight. We start at 7.30, okay, for our uh, evening service. So we have three hours here for dinner and nap or whatever floats your boat, okay? Let me close in prayer. Thank you, Tommy. Maybe next year you can come back and do part two, starting with James Hall Brooks and bringing us up to through progressive dispensationalism. Maybe. Maybe, if the Lord wills. If, if we're still here. If we're still here, that's right. <laughs> also, one other thing is that, that uh, he, he took off, um, but uh, Bill um, Katz. Katz left a calendar here, Jewish calendar, and it's a 16-month biblical calendar, September 2021 through December 2022, and there's enough for everybody to take one, so that's, that's available. All right, let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the fact that we can be here and have this time to fellowship around your word. Uh, thank you for what we have learned in each of these sessions this afternoon. Looking forward to tonight, and we look forward to returning here in three hours. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity. In Christ's name, amen.